There has been an explosion of Metaverse news recently, with new headsets being announced nearly every week. Terms like virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. How are we supposed to know one from the other, and which one is best? I'm Ken Ross, and in this video we're going to define each of these terms, talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each of the technologies, and discuss which ones are best for which use cases. Let's get into it. Now, let's first address the virtual elephant in the room. What do all these headsets have in common? Well, reality, it's, it's in their names. So it's reasonable then to start off by defining what we mean by reality in the context of somebody having a visual experience. In fact, there's an audio version of mixed reality that we'll talk about at the end of the video if you stick around for that. So for our purposes, reality is what a sighted person experiences when viewing the world around them without electronic enhancement to their vision. So with that out of the way, let's talk about our three not-reality options. Augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. In fact, let's talk about AR first, since that's the one that most closely builds on our understanding of reality. There are currently only a couple of true AR headsets on the market, with the most successful of those being the Microsoft HoloLens, followed by the Magic Leap, which is certainly something to keep an eye on. Both of these headsets are completely self-contained. You don't need to connect them to an external computer or phone or tablet. The computer is part of what you're wearing with the headset. The quick way you can tell a true AR headset from those that might claim to be AR is to put on the headset with the power turned off. If you can still see the real world in front of you, it's a true AR headset and not mixed reality, which is what we'll talk about in a bit. AR headsets work by giving you a clear view of the world around you, and then using very clever technology, overlaying that with computer-generated graphics and 3D objects that look like they've been placed into the world physically around you. These projected graphics are sometimes called holograms. These objects not only look three-dimensional, but once they've been placed into the world, you can walk around them and they'll stay put. They are anchored to the physical space. Whether that's sitting on a table or placed on a wall, they truly seem like physical objects. You can also interact with these objects because in addition to projecting these holograms into your space, these headsets are also doing fine detailed hand tracking. So they can tell when you're reaching out and touching that 3D object and give you a simulation of pressing buttons, grabbing, rotating, resizing, many different interactions with those 3D objects, even though they're really just holographic light in your field of view. In my view, this ability to interact with the objects is really what sets true AR headsets apart from some of the AR glasses that have been hitting the market just recently. You've probably seen ads for them. They look very stylish, very small, and they talk about augmented reality. But really, these are just big screen TVs that are built into glasses. Sure, they're cool and they're useful for doing certain things like watching a movie while you're sitting on the couch because they can project what appears to be a 100 inch or 200 inch screen in front of you. But there's no interactivity and the headsets themselves, the, the AR glasses are really connected to your phone and that's what's really powering them. AR headsets like the HoloLens are in use today by surgeons, NASA astronauts, architects, and engineers. They allow the wearer to safely work in their respective environments while simultaneously having a video call via Teams with a remote expert who's able to see everything that the AR user can see and even make annotations directly in their field of view. This allows the surgeon to consult with a specialist during surgery who can point out a potential risk and how to avoid it. It allows the astronaut to access live remote training and diagnostic help for equipment on board the International Space Station. And it allows engineers and architects to see full-size mock-ups of equipment and structures while they're on location and even make changes to the design in collaboration with remote partners that are looking at the same information. 
So where would you most likely want to use an AR headset, a real AR headset like the HoloLens or Magic Leap? Well, they come into play in environments where you want to work on industrial equipment or in a commercial setting or maybe in an architectural setting where it's vital that you can see and interact with the real world as though maybe you are wearing just a pair of normal sunglasses, but then being able to overlay detailed instructions on the work that you're trying to conduct or bringing in an expert to be able to guide you through a difficult surgery or um, a machine repair. These are all fantastic scenarios where AR really shines. I expect that the most recognizable term of the three is going to be VR, virtual reality. VR even got a little famous through books and movies like Ready Player One, and it's most as closely associated with gaming. Now, unlike augmented reality, when you're wearing a virtual reality headset and the power's off, you don't see anything. It's just black. All you can see in virtual reality is what the computer is providing. Whether that's a onboard computer, in the case of something like the MetaQuest headsets, or a headset like the uh, HTC Vive that connects to a PC to provide the experience. In either case, when you're experiencing VR, you don't see anything going on in the outside world. In general, there are two types of headsets in common use today. Those that are entirely self-contained, and those that have to be connected or tethered to a powerful external gaming computer or a gaming console, often with a physical cable in order to provide the content since the computer or console is the thing that's actually running the VR software and creating the experience. Currently, the most popular of the self-contained headsets is the MetaQuest 2. The headset has an onboard computer, storage, battery system, and that allows it to be used for hours without having any other dependencies unless the program that they are using requires an internet connection. The market for this type of VR headset has grown considerably in the past couple of years, thanks in large part to the Quest. And as a result, a new headset from Pico, the Neo 4, and other headsets are now being released to challenge the Quest for dominance. In terms of the most popular tethered headsets, it's probably the HTC Vive. This connects to a Windows PC via a physical cable and runs content from the Steam VR platform. Another tethered system worth mentioning is the Sony PlayStation VR headset. This requires a Sony PlayStation game console to operate, and the latest version, the PSVR 2, requires a PlayStation 5. I should also mention here that most, if not all, of the self-contained VR headsets that we've talked about can also be used as a tethered VR headset connected to a Windows PC, either with the Steam VR library or with the Oculus Meta game library running from that Windows PC. In many cases, you can use these systems uh, completely wirelessly uh, connected to your PC, uh, or you can use a cable as well. It really depends on what your home Wi-Fi environment looks like. In many ways, VR is the exact opposite of AR. When you put on a VR headset, everything you experience is coming from the computer, either the onboard or tethered computer. And if you don't have anything coming from the computer, you don't see anything at all. No power, no reality. However, VR is able to transport the user to a fully immersive virtual world, unlike anything that any other technology can today. In VR, you can engage with computer-generated worlds and characters, interact with objects, and with the volumetric surround sound, it even sounds like you're in the actual virtual world. Some VR headsets can track eye movement and facial expressions and translate that into the faces of avatars used in VR social applications, breathing more realistic expressions into your virtual self. Also, because VR is uniquely able to transport you into fully virtual worlds, it's the preferred technology for the most popular metaverse social environments, including VR chat, rec room, alt space, and others. VR does have some overlap with AR though. Both can use hand tracking instead of controllers, there's also overlap in terms of the markets they serve. AR is mostly considered an enterprise and commercial technology today, with some consumer uses emerging. And VR is considered to be mostly a consumer gaming technology, 
but there's also quite a bit of enterprise and commercial use for training and simulation scenarios. To define MR, let's review what we know so far. With augmented reality, we know that we can see the world around us, and we overlay that with computer-generated graphics, objects, holograms. With VR, we know that we really don't see anything that the computer doesn't serve up. It can generate amazing immersive worlds, including surround sound, but we really don't see much of what's going on around us, and we're pretty much isolated inside of that virtual space. Well, with MR, we get a little bit of both. A mixed reality headset has cameras on the front that view the outside world and provide a color video feed into the headset, which it then processes, overlays any generated computer graphics, objects, and so forth. And what we see is a composite of that result in real time. It's a very AR-like experience, although still entirely computer generated. What generally separates a mixed reality headset from a virtual reality headset, especially given that virtual reality headsets in many cases can also do some form of video pass-through, is that an MR headset leaves the sides of the headset wide open so that you can still see through your peripheral vision the real world, both to the sides and below. This gives you a better sense of place, it can provide additional safety, and you can still see the augmented semi-real world through the video pass-through in front of you. In practice, this means that you can now safely see people walking past you, equipment that might be off to the sides, maybe your keyboard and mouse below you while you're working on virtual screens in front of you. It's a nice mix of the two experiences. Obviously, this ability to see to the sides can have safety implications in commercial and enterprise settings. And it can also help with people that sometimes get motion sickness in VR by being able to visually anchor themselves in the real space. Now, recognizing that sometimes VR is the better option for a totally immersive training experience, for example, almost all of the MR headsets also have the ability to enclose the viewer and put in a, it's known as a facial interface to block the light from the sides and below and act like a traditional VR headset. This gives you the ability of having an AR-like experience as well as a VR experience from the same device. It's even likely that in some situations, the MR headset could be superior to the AR headset. Because of the way that the video content is being processed coming into the headset, we could envision a mixed reality headset that's using infrared or ultraviolet to be able to give the user superpowers of being able to look at scientific instruments and findings that would be impossible without much larger, more complex equipment. In today's market, mixed reality headsets are really just beginning to emerge, with the MetaQuest Pro being the first, followed fairly soon by the Pico Neo 4 Pro. And I would expect to see something coming out of Apple probably early to mid next year. Long term, as technology continues to advance and prices continue to drop, I think we're going to see AR gain in popularity over MR. And I think we'll probably see within five years or so practical, reasonably priced AR glasses that are probably going to be powered by our smartphones in the beginning. And I look forward to that. Oh, and the reason I said you may have already been using mixed reality without realizing it? Well, it's because marketing tends to not know what mixed reality is and often calls it augmented or virtual reality. If you think about programs like Pokemon Go, where you're out hunting Pokemon with your phone in the real world, well, that's mixed reality. Your phone is showing you a picture of real outdoors and overlaying that a 3D object, 3D character of the Pokemon animated and running around. Similar with things like the application from Ikea and other retailers where you can view a piece of furniture in your own living room. Well, that's the camera looking at your real living room, just like a mixed reality headset, and it's overlaying and scaling a 3D model of whatever piece of furniture you're interested in. These are clearly mixed reality scenarios. They just happen to be taking place on your phone or tablet instead of in a mixed reality headset.
Well, since you've made it this far, would you mind taking a minute to hit the like and maybe while you're down there, hit the subscribe button and ring that little bell so that you get notified whenever I produce another video. It really helps YouTube understand that this was a video worth watching and I really appreciate the support. You know, it feels like I've left out something important when talking about our AR, VR, MR technologies. So far, we've really only talked about visual versions of these things. But you know, there's something else, something that I used a lot in the pre-COVID days when I was wandering around the streets of Manhattan. Guess what it might be? It was my AirPod Pros. Those are actually mixed reality devices. Let me explain. With my AirPods on and in pass-through mode, I can hear everything that's going on around me while also being able to listen to music, carry on phone conversations, or ask Siri to provide me with turn-by-turn -turn walking directions, all via voice commands. The audio I get from the real world has been processed and tuned. It's not like the world with the earbuds removed. It's different, and in some ways it's clearer, much like the way that the video feed in a mixed reality headset has been processed, and in some cases is clearer. Likewise, if I want to fully isolate for a different listening experience, I can turn off the pass-through mode and turn on the active noise cancelling, which shuts out the real world entirely so that the only thing I experience is what my phone is feeding me through the AirPods. Just like when I attach a visual isolation facial interface to the Quest Pro and block out the real world from the sides of my headset. Granted, my experience with the AirPods wasn't quite so dancey feeling. Be sure to leave a comment in the section below on whether you're currently using any of these headsets today. If not, is there one in particular that interests you? Do you have questions about it? Let me know in the comments below. Also let me know if there are any other topics around AR, VR, or MR that you'd like me to discuss, or any other topics in technology that I can share with you. For more information on AR, VR technology, be sure to check out one of these videos I've placed here somewhere. And we'll see you in the next video.